The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Toronto-based filmmaker Mark Razzo, whose first full-length work takes him across the big pond to Denmark for the indie drama Copenhagen. Stick around. No underage Scandinavian girls were harmed in the making of this interview. <laughs> so much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of film auteurs planning projects in their own vision of the world's garden spots, including Abidjan, Tehran, Douala, Tripoli, Karachi, Algiers, Harer, Lagos, Port Moresby, and Dakar in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Put the name of a city in the title of your movie, and that place is likely to have either a lot to live up to or a lot to live down to. In indie filmmaker Mark Razzo's Copenhagen, there are three stories fighting for prominence, none of which is actually a tale of the city in which the movie takes place. William, played by Gethin Anthony, is in Copenhagen with his best friend and his best friend's girlfriend to deliver a message to his grandfather, if he even exists. That's thread one. Thread two is that William has a lot of unresolved issues in his life that he hopes will be satisfied by successfully completing his mission in Thread 1. And again, that is Thread 2. Thread 3 is what happens when William relies upon and becomes smitten with a beautiful young waitress, Effie, played by Frederica Dahl Hansen, who becomes his guide to navigating her hometown emotionally and by bike. This final thread is complicated by her own challenges and age and threatens to overtake all else. Copenhagen, which won the 2014 Audience Award at Slamdance, is featured this weekend, March 19th to 23rd, 2014, in case you're watching this in 2020, at the Gasparilla Film Festival in Tampa. After screening the film, I read Variety's review out of curiosity, which describes it as more intriguing than compelling. I respectfully disagree. I thought the film was thoroughly compelling particularly when William and Effie share the screen, although William's character is per perhaps a bit uneven in his emotional responses at times. But at his age, or hers for that matter, what can one truly expect? Their chemistry is undeniable, and therein lies the film's real problem. And I mean the film as you're watching it, not the production of the film. And unlike in Variety, the filmmaker will have every opportunity to respond and discuss Copenhagen here, now. Mark Razzo, welcome to Mr. Media. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, I hope you got to read some of the other reviews as well. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I saw that one and I thought that was enough. I, I you know, I watched the movie. That was more important. But, great. But That's because, great. you know, because the film hasn't been out in greater circulation. Yeah. I was just curious to get a little bit of a response. And hey, you were mm -hmm. reviewed in Variety, you know, good no, matter. No, no, that was cool. That was cool. That was Variety. Um, and so, you know, I kind of wondered, is um, is it fun responding to complaints or criticism of your film, or is that maybe the worst part of the job? Um, it's a fun... No, I mean, it's really it's really hard for me to to get upset over criticism of the film. I understand. And we have had, like quite a number of reviews and and for the most part they've all been 
very, very positive, which is great. But I also have to understand that if they're not, it doesn't change the process of what we went out and we tried to do. You know, as a filmmaker and the actors and everyone involved, we go out to make the best possible film. When we're making it, we believe that audiences will um, take to it. We believe people will like it. We're not going out to try to make a bad film. So you have to take the criticism with a grain of salt and know that whether it's good or bad, you know, we absolutely did our best and we did it with the intention of moving people. Um, and, you know, it's not always going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that in this case it happened to a lot of people. And if one or two people don't feel that way, there's nothing I can really do about it. Now, is Gasparilla uh, this weekend, the Gasparilla Film Festival, is that actually this, only the second time the film has been screened? Yeah, it's uh, it was Slam Dance first, and now it's going to be Gasparilla, and then right after um, the screening in uh, Tampa this this weekend, we're doing five or six festivals back to back to back to back to back. So it's going to get a lot of a lot of screening over the next three four weeks. And what did you notice? I'm I'm going to assume that you were in the audience at Slam Dance to see how it went over. What did what did the audience there, in in your view as the filmmaker, what did the audience get right in their response, and what what did they get wrong and what surprised you in, 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 the, in the way they responded? Um, okay, uh, I'll answer in reverse order of, of, of how you asked it. What surprised me is um, I cut the film myself. We made this film for very, very little money um, and it was just kind of a, a necessary evil of we had it in the can but we didn't have any money to pay an editor. So I cut it myself and I've edited before and I felt okay doing that. Um, and I think through that process, a lot of the humor in the film had lost itself on me. So um, what was surprising to me was how often people were laughing throughout the film. And, and I had kind of forgotten that, that there's a, a humoristic element to this film. So that was very, very nice. Um, what didn't they get? I'm not sure. Um, it's hard for me to really say. The the. The screening, I mean, it won the Audience Award, so you can imagine that the screening went incredibly well. Yes. Um, so, you know, they're, I just felt like the audience was engaged and really into it, and and um, they, they understood it. You know, they understood the deeper meanings that I was trying to get across um, and some of the, the, the themes that I was trying to explore, and that was very rewarding for me. It has... Um... And without giving it away, I'm trying really hard not to yeah. give it away. It Thank has you. it has an Animal House moment to it, really. Uh, <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? I, very early in the film. Um, yeah, involving Effie. Uh, uh, in, in Animal House, it was it was Pinto, uh, who had this moment of discovery uh, in the film, and here William has this moment of discovery with Effie. And if you know if you know Animal yeah. House, you you get it. If you don't, we'll let it go at that. But I mean, you or people watching this. Um, yeah. That to me, it was, it was, it's a shocking moment, and it's a funny moment too. I don't, I, you know, it's yeah. like, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those ones where, yeah, some people, some people are yelling back at the screen on, on that one, which is, which is always great. Yeah, I wish we could talk about it, but I, I will not do that. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a great, it's a great moment in the film. Um, yeah. There are. Um, I think I liked, you know, I could I could almost have gone through and edited out all the I hate to say this, edited out all the scenes with his buddy, mm -hmm. um, because ultimately I didn't feel like they affected the film as much. I yeah. mean, they're there for a reason. I get that, but um, yeah. that would be my only thing. I just felt like they were kind of it was kind of a B story that just didn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought I you know I had thought about it. Um, it would have killed that poor actor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's a great actor. He's like a big theater stage actor out of the UK as well. But uh, I think he's actually on Broadway right now in New York doing a play. But um, he, uh, I thought, I had thought about, you know, I explored everything in editing. And for me, what was important was, and I don't want to give away, I don't want to give away the film either, but, you know, this is a story about a, let's say a boy growing into a man in some sort of way. Um, and, you know, you explained off the top how the story begins. It's William traveling with his buddy and his buddy's girlfriend. There's this kind of triangle. And it was important for me that at some point later on in the story, we get that triangle, except William's on the other side of it. So he's kind of can reflect on 
on where he was at the beginning. And we can see the progress that he made. And I kind of felt like th that the friend was important in that aspect to, to put William on the other side and to kind of show us that, you know, he's evolved from where we met him at the beginning. It was interesting what you just said about him uh, kind of evolving and becoming a man as opposed to a boy. I think that was that was really the thing is that circumstances of the film cause him to realize he is a man and he is not a boy. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, at, at my age, I'm, I'm still I'm still facing that all the time. I'm, you know, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a kid anymore. And I, I sometimes I wake up and I, I have to remind myself I'm not 22. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, I'm, it's true. It's true. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, it, it is, you know, and we don't, of course, I know we don't want to give the film away and maybe people will be frustrated <laughs> hearing us talk about how we don't want to give the film away. But I think, uh, I think his journey, what, what happens in the story to reflect his growth from a boy to a man, it's very deliberate and very um, important. No, I agree. It's you know, I really, I meant what I said. I, I think it's a, it is a compelling film. I, 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 I never stopped it. I mean, sometimes I'll, you know, in this role, you have to watch a lot of films uh, yeah. to decide, you know, who you're going to have on the show and what you feel like you could talk about for thirty or forty minutes. And I never stopped the screener. I never stopped watching it because I wanted to see what was going to happen next. Um, great, that's great to hear. Uh, you know, it was interesting, and uh, William's uh, emotional development was interesting because. You know, there there's moments when he is acting like a boy. You know, he has mm -hmm. no patience. He has no maturity. And then, you know, it comes a point where he's stopping and he's he's thinking about it a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. We we it's funny because we just watched uh, an episode of um, the the ABC show here, uh, Modern Family, last night, and the oldest daughter on that show is going through something very similar to what William is. You can see that after four seasons she is realizing that she is no longer a girl. She's no longer a teenager. She is a woman and it's a little different and she's looking at things a little differently. And I kind of, I, I, I make that analogy to William as well. And that cool. doesn't work for anybody who doesn't watch Modern Family, but too bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did you, um, in the, in the screening at uh, Slamdance, did you learn anything about the film, about your own film based on the audience reaction that either you hadn't anticipated or was there anything, did you go back and change anything in the film? Because it's so early in the distribution that you could do yeah. it if you chose to. Um, I, there was a few moments in the film that I thought, uh, and we're talking like 20 seconds, 20 to 40 seconds, a line here that I thought could be removed. Like, because of the scope and size of the film, for something that small, we can't really go, we can't really justify spending the money to go and make those changes and pull it out and and just even making all the masters again and all the you know it, it just um but that's not a big deal i mean this the it doesn't really affect the film um what what i i think what got me the most um was that i spotted some people like crying at the end and i didn't think i didn't think it was really a crying film you know um, but you know, there's a scene at very right at the end of the movie, and a uh, um, couple scenes um, where I guess you know you you mentioned these three threads off the top where they all kind of converge mm -hmm. at the very end, and uh, um, yeah, and, and it affected some people. So, um, so that was that's that's what kind of I noticed, um, and for some. For some reason, yeah, it had two screenings in Slam Dance, but I was only able to sit in for the first one, um, which was very odd. But I was in, the actors had come in for the second screening, and I was incredibly nervous. Like my parents had come in, and my brother had come in, and I, and I was incredibly nervous that after like five minutes, I had to like run out of the theater and just kind of wait for it to end. But it's really weird. It was it was interesting. Uh, the one thing I would say is that when I got to the end of the film, I felt like I was, I I was comfortable with the end of William's story, and what I really wanted was I want to go back, and I want to see some more of Effie's life. I want to see another chapter of her life, because mm -hmm. there's so much to explore there, and I, I felt like there were so many questions that I had that, you know. So if you want to do me a favor and go back and shoot a a, a, a sequel, you know, Effie's story, I'd love I'd love to watch that. I'd like to see how that goes. Well, you know, ending ending is like. Ending your story is for me the hardest, the hardest part of 
of being a filmmaker or being a storyteller because you want to end it where people are still asking questions and where the characters stay alive in the audience's mind and where people can discuss what happens next. But you also want to give a satisfying ending where they feel like they're not missing out, you know, and they've gotten everything they've came to see. Um, so it was very tricky. And I think we kind of nailed it. Like, I think it ends at the right, the right spot, but I, I totally get what you're saying. And the one thing at Slam Dance that like everyone was uh, coming up, at least ten people said it, um, was that you have to do a you have to do like a before series with this film. You know, you have to like revisit in in um, in eight or nine years, especially because of some of the difficulties in their relationship that might be resolved if that happens. Yeah, I'd like to see. I'd like to see well, again. I, I said it. I'd like to see what happens with the. With Effie. Now, where does this story? What did the story come from? I mean, where does a guy in Toronto suddenly wind up shooting his first uh, film in uh, Copenhagen? Um, my wife is from Copenhagen, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> that's uh, that's how I was introduced to the city before she was my wife um, when she was just my girlfriend. But I went and I lived there, and I just totally fell in love with the city. It's very easy to fall in love with. It's a it's a great city. Hmm. Um, I had the idea. I got the idea for the film there, just from, just from general my general observations of the. There's like a very youthful culture in the city, um, and I thought, you know, there's a great story to tell here. I went to um, after after that year in Copenhagen. I went to New York, and I was studying at Columbia University. And it's it was there that I wrote the script in one of the screenwriting classes. And it, it was just designed as really like a first feature material where you just have a couple actors in the city and you just kind of shoot it on like a 5D and really, you know, kind of go that way. And of course it like evolved to, we had 25 speaking roles and 50 locations and, you know, it's a much more thorough film than that. It's much more um, articulate, um, but that's how it started. That was the genesis of it. And where did you find this young lady, Frederica Dahl Hansen? Uh, she, yeah, she's she's fantastic. I mean, the film is worth seeing for her performance alone, in my opinion. Um, and we, I mean, we did it the old-fashioned way. We had a casting call, and uh, you know, she's um, it's her first English-speaking film, but she has done two features in Denmark hmm. already, and both of them were. Um, her performance in both was quite successful where she was nominated in both of them for Danish, uh, Danish Academy Awards basically. And, and for one of them she had even won. So she had, she'd come into the project with some pedigree. Um, but we still did a casting process and she just kind of won, won us over in the room. Did you have any budget to bring her over here for the, uh, premiere? <laughs> uh, for, fortunately we brought her, yeah, we brought her over and we brought Gethin, Gethin over. It was kind of interesting. Uh, Gethin, Anthony, the lead, He's also based out of the UK. Um, yeah, he was. Uh, people might recognize him on uh, from Game of Thrones. He's a he's an actor on Game of Thrones, and it helped a lot when we were shooting because we didn't have money at the time to bring people over from North America, you know. So it helped a lot. But but then the festival, we brought them both over. It was important for me that they were both there. And um, since we shot the film, we ended up getting some uh, some additional kind of money after it was completed. Um, to bring us through posts, so that was that was great. I was going to say it must make you feel good to, that someone would want to invest money after the after it's been shot. I mean, before it's always a crapshoot. It's like there's yeah, people exactly. who might do it, but after they've actually seen the movie or they've seen dailies or whatever they see, uh, yeah. that they want to spend money. That's got to be reassuring to you. Yeah, it was great. It was we um, I like I said, I cut it myself, and then like we didn't have any money to do anything else, and then we started sending it out, and then we got. Someone, an investor, jumped on board and helped us finish the film properly um, and, and take it through to on its festival run and stuff like that. So that that was really good. Very nice. Now you mentioned, uh, uh, or maybe I was just thinking it, uh, but in the in the film there are a number of uh, U.S., Canada, North America references and, and uh, uh, punchlines, sort of. Um, it's kind of a you're never really sure where these guys are from because it's all the references. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that's clear, I think, is that uh, it's all North America, unless, of course, you're from Mexico. Then it's not North America. <laughs> um, 
being a Canadian, is that is that an issue that you're very familiar with? The you know the kind of blurring of the lines. Yeah, you know what it it definitely was not meant to be as prominent as it was in the film. It was kind of like, um, you know, it was written into a few scenes, and then and then one of the scenes, and the one that you just referenced, which was a uh, um, uh, a scene where they visit like Effie's uncle, basically. We ended up casting this Danish actor who was, and everyone kept telling me like, this guy's a really funny guy. He's like a comedian. He, he's really funny. I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, if I have this like comedian, let, let's uh, let's put some humor into the scene. So I sat down with the two actors before, and this is the only scene in the entire film where we did this. And you can probably tell because it's not really shot the most articulate, but we just kind of like, this is what needs to come out of the scene. Let's see. Um, Let's let's ad lib a little bit. Let's get some humor in there. And I was throwing out lines, um, and he really brought a lot of humor. And I think it's at a good time in the film too. Um, so that's kind of where that the whole the whole Canadian U.S. thing really also takes off a lot. But um, yeah, you know, it's not a it's there, there's no difference anymore. Um, it used to be that Canadians had a good reputation traveling, but now I think they're. <laughs> They're like they're like worse than Australians, even. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. You know, it's funny. I did I was just thinking about this. I did uh, a couple of years ago. I worked with uh, a gentleman named uh, Isidore Sharp. Um, he's the founder of the Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, and I I, I helped him with his uh, autobiography. And so I made a couple of trips to Toronto, which I had not been to before. Uh, okay. Maybe a family vacation, and it was really interesting to me how. I found that the lines were really blurred between, yeah. I mean, Toronto could easily be an American city. Uh, yeah. and, and, and yet it is a very international city. And it, I actually went and looked up. I wanted to know if you would actually shot everything in Copenhagen or not, because frankly, there's probably parts of Toronto that could pass if you needed to yeah. for parts of almost any city. Yeah, it's a very interesting city that way. Um, and it's always kind of, for me, been that way. It's a very multicultural city. But no, we shot everything. Everything was shot in, in Denmark. And was that, uh, w- were there challenges of shooting in Denmark? I mean, was your wife with you, for example, to help you with language or other issues? Uh, yeah, my wife was actually a producer on the film. Uh, she has a film background. I met her in Toronto when she was studying film in Toronto. So that was uh, fortuitous. Um we yeah we had huge issues we got we showed up about six weeks before before uh, principal photography and all we had was a script really and, and 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 two names two contacts and it was kind of like a pyramid thing where we called these two people and like one of them was like Lars Van Trier's producer who's someone like you know, I don't know how that happens and of course they're like uh, no we can't help you but call these people but call these people. And it was just a trickle down effect where eventually people were like, "Oh yeah, that sounds cool." Um, and the the real the real real lucky thing in all of this was like uh, basically a week before we left for Copenhagen, um, and it was just six of us, uh, my wife and some friends from Columbia. I had won the Student Academy Award for my short film, and we used that and milked that for everything it was worth. <laughs> Um, and it really got people interested and involved because a Danish guy had won like five years before and it was a big deal. So they knew what it was and they called it the baby Oscar and they were, they were into it. So that helped tremendously. But, but really we got there and like with a limited budget and, you know, we're shooting in one of the most expensive countries in Europe. Um, so it was crazy. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned about the student Oscar because actually as we were going, the next thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, about that, uh, and and for for reason, um, I'm actually the father of a of a of a girl who uh, plans to go away this fall to study film at college, uh, and just did her first film festival. She was uh, she she won an award at the uh, Palm Beach International Film Festival's uh, student showcase last week. Oh, cool! S- so and uh, yes, I'm 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 boasting. I know that. I realize that, and uh, I guess the, the film just got accepted for selection at the. Green Mountain Festival in Vermont. So I'm, I'm really interested in this because it's a giant leap to be at the edge of going to study for film and walking away with a student Oscar. So I'm wondering, how did you come to the, to the, the attention of the Academy? And, and, you know, tell us the name of the film, by the way, and then just a little about that whole process. Um, the film is called Under, and it is actually going to be 
Um, there's a there's a PBS channel out of San Francisco that's showing it in, in two weeks, and then I think PBS is going to pick it up, um, pick it up and show it all over the country. So it should be available even on their website. Uh, I think in a, in a matter of a few weeks. So it'd be great. If people want to check it out. Um, it was a very ambitious problem uh, project, a, a really really ambitious project, and it was one of those sink or swim projects that it could have it could have kind of failed terribly or it could have worked out really well and uh i kind of went for it and it it worked out really well and i think that's that's kind of what happened i don't know if there's a message in there <laughs> because if it didn't work out really well it would have been you know <laughs> the terrible message to send but um that's that's what happened it was um and you know you you one of my professors at at columbia where it it you know, Columbia has their annual kind of um, screenings and awards at the end of the year, and it didn't do quite well there, um, oddly enough. But sometimes that's how it is. But one of my professors just like, make sure you submit this to the Student Academy Awards, and I did. She signed it. Um, we won the we won the New York region, got sent to the big thing, and uh, they they brought us out to LA for a week and ended up winning that. And uh, that just yeah, it was like a tremendous career um enhancing kind of moment could you have financed copenhagen if that had not happened um we were still going to make the movie but literally the budget went up 150 percent after we won so um but we were still going to make it for just even less money um but yeah that helped tremendously you were still going to shoot it in Copenhagen, or were you going to shoot it in Toronto? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, no, just stuff like Ari, Ari, uh, the camera company, you know, ended up sponsoring us a camera. Oh. So we we had a a real camera instead of you know. So things like that happened. I, I definitely the movie is a much much better movie because because of it. And how has uh, beyond Copenhagen? How has having that student Oscar? Uh, affected your career and and kind of the trajectory of what you're going to do next. Um, well, it I was immediately introduced to um, representation, so I got a a manager and an agent uh, who have been really helpful in getting me projects and and getting me out there. Um, and you know, and then I had done Copenhagen. I was doing Copenhagen independently right off it, and I just think the combination of the two films is um it's it's good it's like you know copenhagen's uh is a first feature and i think people want to be able to see that you can make a feature film and under the short is a much more ambitious much more bigger type of film so you have a sample that you can do something like that so i think combined um they work really well together now are you working uh, i guess this will kind of wrap it up with this are you working on another film now or have you devoted kind of the balance of this year to the film festival circuit and whatever you have to do to make this uh, succeed? Um, I have a few things going on, a um, few things in development. I've attached myself to a script and I'm reading lots of scripts. I'm just trying to find the right project. Um, there's, there's a couple things that I like and that I hopefully can move forward with, but I'm just trying, you know, you have, I'm getting to learn the industry and I know it's, you know, it's a lot of it's about timing and when things hit and when things go. So, so it's just about me finding that right project and hopefully it will work out. But I know I have to also realize that it's not always going to be that way. Um, but you know, maybe if you stick with something. So I hope to be, I hope to be, uh, you know, in the so-called director's chair, even though I stand the entire time. <laughs> um, by by, you know, by the end of the year or into early next year, who knows when? But but hopefully soon, because nice. I love it. Very nice. It's a great story. I mean, your story is a great story. I, I really liked Copenhagen. I hope people will uh, take from this and they will go and watch it. Uh, and folks, the answer to the question is, you can see Mark Razo's Copenhagen at the Gasparilla Film Festival this weekend at the Gasparilla Film Festival. I think I wrote that twice. In Tampa, we want to make sure you remember, Gasparilla Film Festival. Uh, it screens Thursday, March 20th, and again Saturday, March 22nd. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, immediately after Gasparilla, there'll be five or six more festivals. He, immediate, he already knows he's, he's going to. Um, but for film festival screenings, for future video on demand and DVD distribution, I encourage you to visit the website, which is Copenhagen the Movie. 
I hope you can spell Copenhagen by now. Copenhagenthemovie.com. Uh, do you or the film have presence on uh, Facebook, Twitter, or any other social media? Yeah, we have a Facebook page as well, Copenhagen the Movie. Um, and uh, if you're in Tampa, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be at both screenings, so come check out the movie. Say hi to me after. I'll answer any questions and whatnot. Um, Very nice. Yeah, and, and yeah, and all the screenings in your area, if you're watching this in other places, it's all on the website, copenhagenthemovie.com. Very good. Well, uh, Mark, uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. I uh, enjoyed watching the movie. Good luck with this, Ron. Good luck with whatever follows. And uh, thank you very much for joining us Mr. Media today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I don't know if you saw, there's like a thing, I won the Student Academy Award. Right. Um, I may have heard and, about that. And Greg Kinnear was introducing it, and he did the exact same thing. He's like, is it Razo or Razo? <laughs> or, uh, and they like they asked me like two minutes before, how do you pronounce your name? And I told him, so it's kind of funny. Put the name of a city in the title of your movie, and that place is likely to have to, a lot to live up to. <laughs> they must have given up on calling me and now they're calling you. Uh, what's the worst thing that happens? You, you tell your publicist, don't ever book me on that idiot show again. <laughs> the preceding presentation was brought to you by The Realm Network.